most of us have not evolved to multitask and context switch effectively without allowing other important areas of our life to suffer or creating what I call browser tab brain, which is that feeling like you've got too many tabs open in your mind and you can't close any of them, but they're making you run more slowly, right? So put simply, working for yourself is not necessarily better than working for someone else if it means you're just cobbling together a bunch of unrelated and unpredictable sources of income that require your active involvement. Welcome back, rich girls and boys, to The Money with Katie Show. I'm your host, Katie Gaddy Tossan, and today, we are going to talk about something that started with good intent, but has almost surely gone too far. The demonization of the nine to five, the glorification of the multifaceted side hustler and the work for yourself revolution with all of the flexibility and independence and often ignored frenetic context switching and accompanying insecurity. I saw a Medium article the other day about a woman who wrote about her nine sources of income in lieu of a nine to five job that really ran the gamut. And I couldn't help but find myself feeling anxiety on her behalf as I read about her schedule because it wasn't a collection of passive or semi-passive sources of income. It was stuff like reselling my clothes and teaching group fitness classes incredibly active tasks that take time, planning, forethought, you name it. Something that I can verify personally since I have done both of those things for money in the past. And of course it is possible that she just loves all of these things, all nine of these things, and has built an efficient system for including all of them in her schedule in a way that's manageable. But I couldn't help but think, Jesus Christ, that is a lot of context switching for any given week. And she didn't outright say it, but I got the impression by the way she was writing about it that her collection of side hustles cumulatively made less than her full-time job did by the way she discussed the trade-offs between, you know, working her job and quitting it and now doing this. So it wasn't like this abundance of context switching and variety seemed to be generating either excess ease or excess income in her life. And again, that's not a problem but if you are quitting your full-time job to do a small collection of other things for money with the express hope that it'll either A, earn you more, or B, be less stressful, I fear that neither one of these assumptions is necessarily accurate. And there's no shortage of articles of this kind. This was certainly not the first time that I encountered something like this. And they really seem to gain traction for some reason during the global panini. Because man, our generation is obsessed with the side hustle, with shirking the nine to five in favor of working for yourself. And I get it because I did that and I did it, like I do it too. But I, I'm i almost certainly projecting here, but hear me out. I think the glorification of side hustling, so you know, working part-time on the side of working full-time or establishing alternative streams of personal income has definite upsides, but wow, it's also extremely chaotic. I remember working full-time for one company while working part-time for another and teaching fitness and doing money with Katie simultaneously. And to put it lightly, I don't really look back on that period favorably because the amount of exhaustion and anxiety that stemmed from constantly shifting gears and keeping all these different plates spinning for unrelated things made me feel drained all the time. And constantly plagued by that feeling that something is slipping through the cracks right now. So I was only able to maintain that level of output for between 12 and 18 months before my mental health seriously started to deteriorate and I had to make changes. So that period that I'm describing, it still included full-time work. It wasn't just a collection of side hustles, but I think it was an accurate representation of how challenging it is to split your focus among multiple things over the long term. And to a degree, I think it goes against our nature as humans. Most of us have not evolved to multitask and context switch effectively without allowing other important areas of our life to suffer or creating what I call browser tab brain. 
which is that feeling like you've got too many tabs open in your mind and you can't close any of them, but they are making you run more slowly, right? So put simply, working for yourself is not necessarily better than working for someone else if it means you're just cobbling together a bunch of unrelated and unpredictable sources of income that require your active involvement. And maybe it's a generalization, but I always found working nine to five, I still do, so I suppose I still find it that way, to be manageable and maybe even a little boring sometimes with spurts of excitement and crunch. Majority of the time though, my biggest complaint was feeling like I was being underutilized or that I was out of the action rather than the opposite. I didn't often feel stressed by full-time jobs, at least the majority of the time. Sometimes there'd be stress, but not often, uh, regardless of which company or which role it was. So I've worked for three different big companies, like tens of thousands of employees and one startup now, a couple hundred employees. And the startup, surprise, surprise, is the only place where I've ever consistently felt accountable and in charge and like extremely challenged in my own autonomy. Most of the big corporations were kind of the opposite because the diffusion of accountability with having hundreds of people in your department meant that I was not often solely responsible for anything of consequence. And the amount of other people working on any given thing usually meant the workload wasn't too demanding on my level of personal responsibility. This is obviously subjective and anecdotal to my experience, but I'll never forget discussing the merits of working full time with a friend who had recently quit her job at our corporation to pursue her side hustle full time. And this will always stick with me. She said, with a nine to five, you can phone it in some days. You can take time off. You can leave your work computer at home. You can take half a day on Friday, not even think twice. But now I feel like every single thing I do has a direct and immediate consequence. There's no phoning it in anymore. There's no real difference between my weeks and weekends. And there's nobody to guide me. And at the risk of oversimplifying, working for yourself sometimes paradoxically provides less flexibility and diminishes your ability to only work when you want to, because your output directly affects your revenue, unless you've set up something entirely passive, in which case, please call me. Some people will almost certainly thrive from that thrill and that sense of importance. Others will be surprised by it and find it jarring. And I think if we're gonna promote the merits of working for yourself, we have to do so honestly and acknowledge the pitfalls. We must set expectations honestly because sometimes working for yourself is a breeze, but most of the time it is objectively more challenging and more of a roller coaster than having a nine to five is. So if your hope in quitting your nine to five job is to take a cruise down easy street, you might wanna think twice. I fear that this obsession with side hustles does two things that make things worse for people and particularly young people. Number one, it pressures people to monetize their every hobby. This is something I feel guilty about encouraging from time to time, honestly, because it did work out well for me. But I realize there is a bit of survivorship bias here, and I often don't talk about all the side hustles I had that did not become lucrative businesses. Hint, there were a lot of them. I actually highlighted some of them in a blog post about wasted effort that I will link in the show notes. But when I visited my parents in their retirement community, I noticed something important and different. These people who are in a different generation than I am have tons of hobbies that bear no prayer of monetization. They garden, they golf, they putz around on their pontoon boats and they sit outside and they look at birds. They do crossword puzzles and they read. And these are things that I almost can't fathom most of my generation engaging in in any meaningful way. I actually forget the last time I did something that I couldn't either justify as indirectly productive, like even a walk is accompanied by a finance podcast with the thought that that time should be spent learning something I can turn into content. And there's nothing wrong with being productive, but I have recognized in myself an inability to turn it off. And I fear it is a bit of internalized glorification of life hacking and monetizing everything into oblivion at the extreme sacrifice of ever having any true leisure time for the sake of just having leisure time. And number two, it makes people place an undue emphasis on the idea of working for yourself. Nobody is more acutely aware of their responsibility to their employer than someone who just spent 15 minutes on money Twitter. 
Those people will have you believing that your employer has you in handcuffs, chained to the furnace in the office boiler room. Now make no mistake, I completely understand the fear and the uncertainty around having a single point of failure in your earning, like one job source or one source of income. But most people throughout most of history have only had one source of income. Most people are always living close to the edge in that way. It's not unusual to work only one job. In fact, I downloaded US census data to fact check this because I was curious how prevalent it is and fewer than 10% of the population has more than one source of income. There's certainly something to be said for establishing multiple sources of income, but the millionaires have seven sources of income stat is often misrepresented to suggest that your average millionaire is running seven different side hustles and that's just not the case. I think of a family friend who's worth millions of dollars and he is mostly earning money right now on residual deals from the past that are still paying him. So being a hardworking go-getter is great, but don't let someone guilt you into becoming an Uber driving, Facebook marketplace reselling, moonlighting Etsy retailer against your will because you're trying to hit seven individual streams of income. And sometimes I have to remind myself of this, if you lose your job, you will get another one. It's not worth stressing yourself out about finding a second or third source of income if your first one is relatively stable and you've got enough saved to support yourself if shit hits the fan. Hell, even traditionally unrelated sources of income can be impacted by the same market or economic forces as evidenced by March 2020 when my full-time airline job and my part-time fitness job were both threatened overnight by the same thing. I thought I had my bases covered because I was thinking, oh, if I get laid off because people stopped flying, I'll just have this backup job that I can scale up and generate more income. Easy. But then I was swiftly reminded that both travel and boutique fitness are things that people do in groups with discretionary income and I was not as safe as I thought. And I guess you could point out my initial flawed logic here that neither travel nor high-end group fitness is recession proof. So my founding thesis that because these two things are unrelated, they'd be affected in an uncorrelated way that was flawed to begin with, right? But to that end, COVID-19 taught us a valuable lesson in general that we're not as in control as we'd like to feel. And stacking our income deck with random revenue generating activities at the expense of our own time and happiness may just be giving us a false sense of control. And what drives a need for control? Fear and scarcity. I didn't realize how much this fear impacted my outlook and my sense of security until I talked to my friend Bridget. She's Bridgie Casey on Twitter and Instagram. She's a Canadian personal finance writer. And she laid it out for me straight. She said, your irrational fear of losing everything you have stems from our collective cultural obsession with scarcity that just erroneously motivates people to work harder than they need to. She was like, you've already got half a million in the stock market. You're fine. You've already won. Now, I know that that's a very privileged perspective, having already reached that point in my investing life. And you might be like, well, that's great for you, asshole, but I'm nowhere close to that. So your newfound comfort is completely useless to me. But her point is interesting as part of this larger conversation around fear and scarcity based hustle. Sure, it's effective to some degree if it means it's going to push you to earn more, but at what cost and to what end? And are we doing this in a way that's efficient and gives us the highest ROI or are we just hustling aimlessly? It's inefficient and it's counterproductive when it encourages favoring a bunch of small fluctuating sources of income that require independent management to one big source of income that's relatively predictable and manageable and dare I say, scalable. Just because your nine to five job can be taken away and sure, one source of income is dangerously close to none sources of income, it doesn't mean you should preemptively give up that one source of income. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with that one source of income. And so often I think we underappreciate financial freedom in favor of our relentless pursuit of financial independence. And my definition of these two things are different because financial freedom to me is the point at which the first consideration for any given decision isn't money anymore. 
when you've bought yourself enough runway to change course without serious consequence. Financial independence, obviously, is the point at which you no longer need to work at all, your work optional, the ultimate flexibility. But the reality is, once you have financial freedom, you've already earned yourself the permission to not live in fear anymore. Congratulations, you have done enough to protect yourself from any major downturns, and you are officially going to be okay, even in the worst case scenarios. You might not be totally unscathed, but you're definitely not going to be totally screwed either. For example, if you've got, say an emergency fund and three years worth of spending in the stock market. So pretend you spend $40,000 per year and you've got $120,000 in the market. You have sufficient runway. Even if your portfolio lost 50% overnight and your job went out the window at the exact same time, you would still have a year and a half of technical runway before you'd be out of money. And obviously you wouldn't want to have to draw down on those funds because that would undo your progress from the past. But even if it took six months for you to find another job, you know you've built up a moat of capital large enough to make sure that you're okay. Today's Money with Katie episode is brought to you by Caribou. You have surely noticed that the cost of literally everything is on the up and up. I've been constantly tinkering with my budget to account for extra spending on everything from gas to groceries while still setting aside some savings. It kind of feels like it's getting impossible to keep living your life unless you refinance your car through Caribou. Caribou helps you take control of your car payments. The application is super easy and you can even pre-qualify for loan offers without impacting your credit score. Huge win. Caribou customers save on average $100 a month on their car loan when they refinanced through Caribou. See how much you can save by checking your rate at caribou.com slash money with Katie. Terms apply. Visit caribou.com slash money with Katie for details. This episode of the Money with Katie show is brought to you by QAI. I don't know about you, but I love a good theme. A space cowgirl bachelorette, a 90s themed birthday, a themed investment, that's right, you can give your investment strategy a good theme and make sure it understands the assignment with QAI. QAI offers investment kits that make it easy for you to invest in a single click based on your interests or economic trends. Their award-winning AI will automatically rebalance your trades for optimal performance. Investing with QAI is free. Love to hear that. And right now, you can get a $100 bonus to your account funded with $100 or more. Sign up at refer.tryq.ai slash mbrew. That's refer.tryq.ai slash mbrew. So I think for me, it comes down to this question of when should you push yourself and forsake balance? And when should you get maybe a little bit more realistic and back off a little bit? Maybe the ideal timing or approach would be the following. Put the pressure on yourself to side hustle while you climb the corporate ladder until the point at which you've got a sufficient amount of runway. So for example, a net worth that is representative of a few years worth of necessary spending, like the 40,000, 120,000 example, and then reassess. Do I still want to work multiple jobs? Do I still want to put the pedal to the metal? Is there anything I'd reassess now that I've reached the point at which I am financially buffered from even long-term worst case economic scenarios? And I struggle with that discussion of income scarcity and scarcity in general because I've seen firsthand the paradoxical positive outcomes that being afraid of losing everything has created in my life. So I'd be remiss not to accredit some of my professional success on some level to sustained paranoia and fear, but that same paranoia and fear has driven me at times to living in a state of agitation and not infrequently unhappiness, um, the impossibility, right, of being present thanks to just constantly fearing the other shoes about to drop. And it's really hard to make decisions about the most efficient way to scale up income and proceed forward when you're in that mental state. It's the reason why I caution embracing the side hustle life too extremely or making any drastic changes. And that's why I wanted to talk to Sania from Flynanced, who is the self-proclaimed guide for nine to five hotties, which I fucking love. So Sania, welcome to the Money with Katie show. I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you so much, Katie, for having me. This is awesome. Absolutely. So to start, 
I'm curious, just to level set for everybody, can you give us a quick rundown of your career path so far? Absolutely. So I've spent all of my career working in product management. I started working fresh out of college college in a one-year graduate program and landed my first job at American Express where I was, yeah, the most junior person on the team. I was a senior analyst at that time, but on a product management team. So back in those days, my team was launching the gold card. So if anyone has the American Express gold card. I have the gold card, (laughs) but I got it because it's pink. Exactly. (laughs) So all of those decisions around around that product, how it was priced, how it was going to kind of be this new entrance into this like dining focus rewards card, all of that was was the team um, that I that I worked on then. I stayed at Amex a little bit longer, was promoted, became a manager of product development, and then was kind of only working wow. on new product launches um, at Amex on their consumer side. So I got to launch the green card, the reimagined green card, uh, the Delta refresh that happened back then. So it was really cool, wow. a really great, cool time and an amazing first job for me. Um, and then I realized I wanted a lot more money. <laughs> And uh, Don't I, I didn't want to have to wait for it, right? So yeah. I ended up transitioning to another company. I worked at MasterCard, still in a product development function, uh, but more so working on a technical product. So it wasn't necessarily like this end consumer facing product, but it was a technical software that uh, MasterCard sold to banks around the world. So I did that for a little under two years and then recently made the jump into tech where now I'm a technical product manager working on a web-based product. So, you know, I I love to say that I fell into product management, but as I've grown in my career, I've learned that, one, it's a super in-demand skill that I think more 9 to 5 hotties yeah. should learn about. Uh, but that, <laughs> too, it definitely gave me, you know, a lot of confidence to be able to chart my own path in terms of building mm-hmm. the career story that I wanted for myself, which was, Yep, I've done the consumer facing thing. I've done the technical thing. Now I'm working on digital products. Um, and this has kind of been my journey as a, yeah, as a young product manager in financial services and tech. Wow. So when did you start your career? How, like start to finish that story that we just heard, how many years did that encapsulate? Start to finish that encapsulated just about five years. So I've jumped, I've worked at three companies oh and had four roles in five years. Yeah. That is so fast. You that's fast. amazing. So what did you study? Funny enough, uh, in, in undergrad, I studied Africana studies. So I went to a woman's college, shout out Barnard College, um, and I majored in Africana studies. I absolutely loved it. It was the first time I really had a chance to kind of read specifically about African-American culture and history. Um, and then I did a one year master's program in, in business management. So, uh, needless okay. to say, very I had, cool. I had no, you know, formal training, no certificates in product management. I fell into that very first job at Amex through networking. So, okay, that's what I was going to go for. Is so the networking. So that's really interesting because I, before I left my role at a tech company to do this, I was a content designer and prior to that was a product owner. Mm -hmm. And so, but when I, I I didn't know any of that stuff existed when I was in college. And I think for a while I would look at tech and look at fields like that and say, I don't have the technical skill sets to be doing those things. And it, I think I held myself back for that reason. And I, I didn't know that you could really study anything and then work your way into the field. So on that note, um, your work, and by your work, I mean your content creation work, what inspired you to take this niche focus in your work, the nine to five thing? Because I, most of the personal finance creators that I talk to and follow are very much, I think, all about this entrepreneurial lifestyle. And I think that really sets you and your work apart and makes what you share really relatable for the majority of people who you know, probably do have a standard nine to five job. So where did your pro nine to five point of view come from? I love this question. I would honestly say that it's evolved. So when I started finance and started showing up as a creator and, you know, I just saw you posted about this, Katie, talking about your very first post on your Instagram (laughs) account. Um, Back then, I just kind of wanted to talk about my debt payoff journey. I wanted to talk about travel um, because I felt like a voice was missing. I felt like I... I was being called to kind of add my voice to 
dispelling this narrative that you have to shame yourself for how you want to spend your money as you are building wealth, as you're paying off debt. And, you know, as my community grew, as I grew as a creator and really learned what my audience wanted to hear from me, I realized two things. One, I realized that I wasn't giving the people that I was serving the clear steps to be able to do the things that I was doing, like putting all of this money into paying off debt and investing and building my net worth because I wasn't really showing them how I was doing it, which was through my nine to five. So at the yeah. same time, I'm hearing from people in my audience saying, this is great. I want to do all the things you're doing. I want to travel. I want to invest more. I want to build wealth. But sis, I don't make enough money. That was happening at the same time that I was also kind of feeling, you know, like I feel like I I try to pride myself on being a transparent and authentic creator. And it's kind of like mm -hmm. what has been possible for me in terms of my financial wins and the transformation that I've had in my money is because of my nine to five career, right? It's because I, I fell that. into this, this, you know, in demand career path, which I love what you just said, right? I had no idea product management even existed when mm -hmm. I was like in college, I fell into this and then realized, wow, I can make a lot of money with this. I can continue to build transferable skills. Every year that I'm in this career path, this idea of a product manager is becoming more and more mainstream, right? So all of this was kind of happening at the same time. And that's when I really kind of felt like, all right, there's a need for this that I need to be speaking to other working women like me who may not have ever had this blueprint to say, how can I take this job that I have and turn it into the lifestyle that I want? So that's kind of what I just started doing. I just said, okay. I'm just going to start telling you guys what I do. I get the question all the time. What do you do? How do you make money? Mm -hmm. And that's when things just like totally went off. Like I, yeah, I, I went viral many times over, grew my following, doubled my following in a month. It was insane. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's oh, been I insane. Saw. Yeah. I remember because <laughs> you hit a hundred thousand followers and then three weeks later had 150 and I was like, Samia is on some other shit over here. I'm like, let me, I'm like, I'm going to need to take a page out of your playbook, but okay. That is super helpful. And I think for anyone listening who this is the first time that they're hearing you or seeing you and they're like, wait a second, I've never even heard of product management. Can we get like a quick 30 second kind of breakdown of what it is? I'm sorry to put you on the spot like this, but I think it would be helpful. Absolutely. So a product manager is someone who's really owning the end to end life cycle for for a product. So when I say a product, a product can be a tangible product like a credit card, like a you know, even like a piece of clothing, that's that's considered a product, right? All the way to an intangible product, like a software, like an app, right? So I like to say that all of the all of the things that we interact on a daily basis, there's probably a product manager behind the look, the feel, and how we interact with it, right? So a great example is Instagram, right? There are product managers yeah. who are thinking about every detail. Tons of them. Uh, right, tons of them that are thinking about every detail in terms of why buttons are placed a certain place, how they want you to have an experience, how they want you to interact with the app as an example, right? So mm -hmm. I really love product management because it allows me to be able to become this like subject matter expert of something, but also be able to work with a lot of different people, right? A product manager yeah. is not just kind of owning everything on their back. They work with highly cross-functional teams um, to be able to make their products successful. So I think that's why I've really enjoyed being a product manager, but yeah, that's in a nutshell what a product manager is. And it really can look different depending on the industry you're in, the company that you're in, the products that you're working on. But in general, all product managers are thinking about how do I take this product from an idea, execute it, launch it, make it successful, and then you know make those decisions around when it's time to either sunset mm -hmm. or improve this product. That is really cool. So if anyone's listening and they're like, I wanna do that, now you know who to follow. We'll put hey. our handle in the uh, show <laughs> notes. So, you know, we were talking about kind of your following and how, how explosive your growth has been talking about like nine to fives in particular. I'm curious if you get pushback from people and if you do, what kind of pushback do you hear from people about, you know, anything that you're kind of creating about? Absolutely. So, you know, I call my followers nine to five hotties. And I, I want to <laughs> say this because I think I this is it. like spot on for what we're talking about. Right. Like this this like term popped in my head 
around the same time that I feel like I was seeing a lot of content that was really demonizing the nine to five job. Like, so I love this. Mm -hmm. I love this idea for this episode um, because that's really what inspired me to start talking about, not just talking about nine to fives, but like putting some respect on other working women like me (laughs) who are just like, put some respect on our names, right? Like there's nothing wrong with having a nine to five. And many of the entrepreneurs and like creators that I follow, many of them started working in nine to five jobs, well paid nine to yeah. five jobs at that, yes. that yeah. allowed them to have the money to be able to put into a business, to be able to put into working capital, to be able to put into real estate investments, right? So it's like, why are we acting like everyone should just wake up one day and become like an online entrepreneur and it's just yeah. roses and <laughs> so butterflies? Like, like that's a lie, right? So, yeah. so I, I term, I you know, I coined this term nine to five hotties and that's what I call my followers. But I think the biggest pushback to go back to your question, I think the biggest pushback that I that I get, <laughs> I honestly forgot I asked it, so it's fine. <laughs> I think the biggest pushback that I get is, um, you know, I, I think I get some fair criticisms around. Uh, some of my content being a little bit too aspirational for people, right? So hmm. we talked about this, my career journey, I've I've made incredible leaps and bounds in my career in just five years of working. But at the same time, I've also grown my salary four and a half times. I've doubled my total compensation in one year, right? Like my very first job working at Amex, that first year that I worked, I only made $48,000. Now I make well yep. over $200,000. Like that is... <gasps> An extremely which by the way can we just pause to be like a that's amazing b bless you for saying it i'm so tired of people being hush hush and cagey about how much money they make like you we have to talk we about to. the numbers that are out there because someone listening to this could be like oh yeah that sounds okay it's like well if i know that i can make over two hundred thousand dollars with five years of experience that might make this you know push it past that sounds okay to like oh this is actually worth the time and effort to look into so anyway i digress but thank you for the transparency absolutely no yeah i i think it's so important especially for the people that we serve so you know i think i i think that's some of the biggest pushback that i get it's just like you know this is unrealistic like people can't make these kind of jumps that you've been able to make um and you know i think there's i think there's some fairness to that right like as a content Mm -hmm. creator i think you know, we're often balancing keeping up with these algorithms, but also just creating content that we know people want to see, right? Like, right. I think someone is more likely to sit and watch a video of someone talking about, hey, I went from 48,000 to 200,000 in five years, this is how I did it, versus, <laughs> hey, here's what I do in my nine to five. Like, no one cares, right? Like, yeah. so yeah. I, I, I- You gotta clickbait up a little bit. A, a little bit, a little bit. But it's also, I mean, little bit. it is my story, right? I'm not inflating my numbers. It is the truth, right? right? I've been featured in in real pieces of journalism where people have fact checked that my numbers are real, right? So I think that's probably some of the biggest pushback that I get um, is just around like, you know, how realistic is this really? Like, Mm -hmm. this is kind of like not really something that I feel like I can Mm -hmm. do, I can aspire to, like. But I would say beyond that, I think one of the challenges that I am consistently trying to overcome as a creator, right, is that, you know, I'm not a I'm not a career coach, right? And I don't seek to be. Right. I'm not a recruiter, right? right? So I actually have no power on getting people hired. So I think something I'm also navigating is this space where I'm a creator. I want people to know these opportunities are out there, but I am not necessarily creating, you know, these pipelines for people to get hired. So then, you know, kind of What are the limits that I can do as a creator, as someone that is putting out all this great information that obviously people want, need, especially in times like this, but then how do I actually like, you know, direct them to real resources, to real individuals who can help make those decisions for them? I think that's probably something that I'm also still continuing to work through, right? Like I've talked about everything from you know, budgeting to debt management to travel hacking to now talking more about careers. And I think with that, it's like, you know, as a creator, I always want to make sure that I'm not just putting out free smoke, but like actually helping people with my content. Like I'm not just trying to like, you know, put out a bunch of pieces of content, just making people feel like either good or bad about their financial situation. But I really want to help people with my content. So I think that's kind of like where I'm at right now is like, okay, great. Like, I put out these fire pieces of content. Obviously, it <laughs> resonates with people. Uh, but what can I yeah. do more as a creator to actually like guide people to real resources where 
they can actually get the help they need, you know? Right, right. That makes a lot of sense. And I think to give to give yourself some credit, though, I do think that um, the, I guess, visibility, representation, awareness thing, that goes a really long way. Because I think until somebody sees someone else doing it, you have, I mean, I think we don't even realize the limits and the boxes that we put ourselves in. Yes. Like I used to think all the time, well, I have a communications degree. No one's going to pay me six figures. I'm not worth that. And I think until I saw other people, other women making multiple six figures, doing things that I thought I could do that. Like that's not beyond my, you know, scope of comprehension or intellect or competence. Then you know, you have to see someone else that's done it in order to believe that it's possible for you. So I do think that even with the pushback that maybe this is aspirational or maybe your path or your success has been extreme, I still think there's a fine line, right, between aspiration and inspiration. And I think for a lot of people, they're going to see that and be like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that was even possible. And that's going to open a lot of doors. No, you're so, absolutely right. You're absolutely right, Katie. And I'm glad that, I'm glad that we said that because I think I think that's probably why my content has resonated so much with people as I think one, they're learning about career paths that maybe they didn't even know were possible, that they already had skills mm -hmm. that they could be working in. Two, I think actually giving people a new way to see how they can break into some of these industries that kind of feel like yeah. they're super mysterious and like, how do I get into fame companies? Like what skills do I yeah. actually have? And then I totally agree with you. That third point is like, yeah, how many black women are even talking about this stuff? Like, totally. It's 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 not as common as as we think. Um, so I think I, I really appreciate you saying that. Like, thank oh, you. Thanks. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. I think representation is extremely important because if you don't see somebody that looks like you doing the thing you want to do, how are you going to know that that's possible for you? Absolutely. And I think. It's also like, I think so much of that happens on a subconscious level too. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think we even realize that we feel those limits until we see someone defying them. And then we're like, oh, wow. So you mentioned too, like, especially right now. And I assume you're referring to like the current, you know, economic situation, the job market. Yeah. It seems like, and I, I'm not super plugged into this data. So you correct me if I'm wrong. Keep me honest here. It seems like the job market is still pretty good right now. Um, I don't know if it'll stay good, but what types of industries and roles do you frequently tell people to pursue? Like for a listener that is not engaged with your content yet, uh, is it all tech? Are there other industries or sectors or, you know, types of things that you're consistently kind of like, you know, making people aware of that you're a fan of, or, you know, has that changed this year? Can you give us a sense for that? Absolutely. So I love telling my followers to actually start their search in the financial services industry. That's where I started my career. Mm. And that's where I think that there is still a ton of growth and stability, even in these challenging times. And why I recommend that, you know, folks who are in their job search really look into financial services companies is that I think often a lot of us think, oh yeah, I wanna get into tech, but have no idea like what the barriers to entry are. And I've found, right. even in my own experience, that the barriers to entry in financial services are often much lower. So say, for example, you're someone who wants to pivot into product management, you might have a faster way of getting your foot into the door of a financial services company like a Square, a Stripe, an American Express, a MasterCard, a City, a PayPal, et cetera, getting that experience, getting that title, and then be able to use that and leverage that to go wherever else you want to go, right? Hmm. Instead of trying to go straight to a big tech yeah. company, right, where you might be competing with other established yeah. technologists, right, who have other experience and can kind of show that, you know, that they're kind of already in that industry. So I love telling hmm. people to start with financial services. One, because I think you learn a lot. I think there's still an incredible amount of growth that's happening at these companies as they're creating products and services that are reacting to people's need for more, you know, financial stability right now. Um, and then in terms of roles, I mean, I love to talk about product management because I mean, the product mm -hmm. management industry has completely exploded even the five years that I've been working. Um, and why yeah. I love to tell people about product management is because there really is no other role, I think, that can allow you to, easily get into a technical field to really mm. get to some of those like 
higher paying because it is a strategic role without really any prerequisites. Like there are really no yeah. prerequisites to becoming a product manager, um, right? There is no, oh, everyone has to be PMP certified to be a product manager. That's not true, yeah. right? Like, and I, I try a lot in my content to push against <laughs> this narrative, right? If you want to invest in those types of certifications and that kind of learning, by all means do it, but you don't need it to become a well-paid product manager, right? Like I don't yeah. have any of those things as part of my background. I don't have any technical certifications. You know what I went to school for, liberal arts degree, come on, right? Like <laughs> I networked my way into product management and learned on the job and that's what's allowed me to build this career, right? So I love helping people about product management and I also have a lot of nine to five hotties who follow me who have worked in probably like customer service, like executive assistance roles. I love to tell mm -hmm. them about program management, right? Because they have all of the oh, skills yeah. of being a program yes. manager and don't even know that by simply switching the way that they talk about themselves as they show up in these job interviews, as they craft their resumes, that they could be getting 30, 50, 70, $100,000 more in income by just now showing up as a program manager and not an executive assistant, right? Like even just like the language that we use to talk about our skills and talk about the work that we've done, I think that is kind of also what I'm trying to like help put into the ethosphere. Like there's plenty of jobs out here and I definitely agree with what you yeah. said about like the job market is still hot, but I think the biggest gap is that so many of us feel like well, do I even have skills to get some of these jobs? Yes. Mm. But like, when have you taken a, a, when have you taken that time to kind of reflect and say, hey, I actually have a lot of these skills that they're looking for in program managers. Like, why don't I like just start to show up as a program manager, right? Um, and, and use that to your advantage to get to those big obnoxious bags that we all deserve. Those big <laughs> I love you. I'm sitting here grinning because I can't get over how like, I just know, I just know there's someone listening to this that's an executive assistant that's like tired of making what she's making or he's making what he's making. I'm saying she, cause 80% of our audience is female, but, yeah. um, and I can just like feel the wheels turning preemptively. So I just love how actionable that is. And the note on the financial services industry in general. So I guess, uh, in a nod to that, to that person who may be listening, who's like, I want to make $200,000. What would you tell someone who is frustrated with their current compensation. Maybe they are in a field or a role that's not highly paid, um, or maybe there's something else going on there. I know that is kind of a generic question, but I think I wanna give somebody that actionable step of like, where should they begin? If they know that they're frustrated, they know they wanna make more, where's the best kind of starting point? I think the best starting point is to start where you already are. Start at the company okay. where you already are, right? Mm, so love. if you are in a role where you feel like you're being underpaid, overworked, and your skills are underutilized, start to have those conversations, one, with your immediate manager to kind of understand like, okay, I feel like I want to grow in my career here. Let's start to connect me with other hiring managers at the same company that I can talk to and mm -hmm. kind of understand what they're looking for, right? Like... Companies want to retain talent, especially in a job market like this where yeah. companies Ooh, small and wide point. are completely being purged of their high performing talent. So if you're one of those people who you're getting these good remarks, right, you have great reviews, performance reviews every time they come around, use that to your advantage and start to see who else is looking for people like you with your skill set. What I've already said is that many of the jobs that we want, we are going to learn on the job right. how to do them, right? So right. I think a great example is like someone who is, you know, in a very like front front office facing, business facing role already, start to see like, do you have product managers at your company? Do you have program managers at your company? Like who can you start to talk to that's kind of more so in the more technical roles at your current company? Start mm -hmm. to network with those people and kind of understand how can I internally make the switch over to more of the work that you guys are doing. I think the benefits of that is you may be able to see an increase in your salary staying at the same company once you move, right? Say if you're a marketer now and you move to product management, that may come yeah. with a bigger salary because 
your company yep. may see a product manager as a more technical role. Can confirm. <laughs> exactly, right? Um, and then I think from there, really seeing, can you continue to grow in that, right? I think if you've exhausted yeah. those options and like, you just don't feel like you can do that internally, that's when you can start to say externally, okay, based on the skills that I have, what are those jobs that I can, that, that work for me, right? So I share this a lot in my free content. If you download my free guide, link to my bio, I give you some job mm-hmm. titles, but it's really just starting to do that discovery work to say, okay, these are the things that I've really enjoyed in this role. These are the things that I feel like come easily and natural to me. What are the jobs that align with that, right? Like, if I'm telling yeah. you, okay, I, you know, I got a lot of hotties who are like, yeah, I, I have a sales background. Do you know that you could be like a business analyst? Do you know that you could be like, that you could be like a, a tech a tech sales lead, right? Tech sales leads make mm-hmm. an incredible amount of money, right? Like you already have those same yeah. skills, but you've never called yourself yeah. these other job titles, right? So that's where I would say start. I would say it's always easier to make an internal pivot, whether that's to another team, whether that's trying to get promoted internally, whether that's trying to like move into another part of your existing organization. Once you've exhausted that or, you know, like me, you got to a point where you're just like, yeah, I'm making the most money that I can make at this job level. Yes. These people are not going to promote me fast enough. So I need to be looking elsewhere. That's when we can start to job hop. That's when we need to start saying, okay, what job titles are out here and what are these company, what companies are hiring for these job titles? And then just get really focused in on your search. I think it's very easy to get overwhelmed in the vast sea of hundreds of thousands of open jobs out here. But I think when you come in really focused and say, yep, these are the two to three job titles that I feel like match my skill set right now. Like I don't need to upskill. I don't need to get a certificate. Like right now, these are the skills that I have. Mm -hmm. These are the two to three job titles that I have. Boom. I'm going to hit the pavement. I'm going to use LinkedIn. I'm going to use my network and start to see what companies are already hiring for these roles and just focus my efforts there, right? I think that is probably the best plan for anyone listening who's really ready to, you know, get hired quickly. Wow. Okay, so I'm amazed, A, because you pretty much described exactly how, (laughs) and I didn't have the forethought to do this. I didn't know that that's what I was doing as it was happening. But that's exactly what happened to me. As I was in marketing, as a brand copywriter, switch teams to become a UX writer, didn't know anything about Mm. UX writing and just followed this, you know, followed suit of the principal UX designer on my team, learned a lot for two years and then moved to Facebook and doubled my salary. So yeah, yeah, it it, it all took the, the jump of like going on LinkedIn and changing my title from copywriter where I never got any recruiter messages to UX writer where every single day I was getting recruiter messages. And I was like, weird, because I'm the same person and I have the same skills. And yet this title is, they're just flooding the door. So I think that there's, um, I'm just, I love that you took such a generic question and we're like, these are the 12 steps in this order, do it this way. And I'm like, yeah, can confirm that that does work. Oh my goodness. No, I love that. And, and I'm, And thank you for like giving us your real life lived experience to show how possible it is. Because I think sometimes when I'm telling people this, I think they're just like, well, that's, that's just like too obvious. Like it's just too, but I'm like, (laughs) that's, that it's literally how it works. That's literally how it works. And one thing that you just said that I want to call out is I think especially we get really overwhelmed with LinkedIn, but keep in mind, LinkedIn, just like IG, just like Twitter, just like TikTok. LinkedIn has an algorithm, right? So what did you do, Mm -hmm. Katie? You gave the algorithm more of what it wanted to see. Yeah, no, no one's hiring for copywriters. Tell it what it wants to hear, Exactly, but all these recruiters are already looking for these UX writers. So now, yeah, we're going to bump Katie's profile up to the top of the algorithm because she's she's using the language that we want to see. Like, it's, yeah, it's, and and this is not to shame anyone if you're listening to this and feeling like, oh, wow, this make sense like yes and and really think about what are the reasons why we have been consistently told to overcomplicate our career paths is because i don't know the powers that be clearly do not want women especially to have this kind of knowledge to know oh yeah. wait this company's not paying me not nearly what yeah. i deserve i can go somewhere else like mm-hmm. i want y'all to fumble me like i'm the prize like <laughs> i will go somewhere else right and i think back to like yeah, this was early 2020, right before the pandemic hit. I'm at Amex. And I'm just like, I need more money. Like, there's no way I'm going to be able to pay off all my debt on the same mm-hmm. salary. And I remember having, you know, some people in my ear being like, 
what do you mean you're going to leave the company? Like, you have all of these great relationships and so many people want to see you win. Like, how can you give up that brand equity? And I'm just like, none of that shit is paying my bills. Like, actual equity. I will give it up for actual equity. Period. Period. And I really (laughs) think that too, you know, I have colleagues who are still at those same companies, at those same teams. Yeah. Our financial pictures couldn't be more different. Like, in the same time that they stayed in those same roles, and like, yeah, maybe gotten a merit increase or a promotion here and there. What? I've like tripled my income, like mm-hmm. to the point where I don't think about money because my nine to five yeah. now oh, is so paying powerful. me enough that, right? Like, that I'm not like yeah. stressing over the fact that, like, I've always been a hard worker. Now I feel like my compensation finally caught up with the amount of work that I feel like I put into my career, you know? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, and I love too that you ever think about the fact that I used to tell myself all that that when I, you know, I'd make $50,000 and I'd be like, this is the least amount of money you're ever going to make. Like you're a stock that's going up. (laughs) Trajectory's going up. So same thing. It's like, you're at over 200,000. You're like probably still the least amount of money you're ever going to make, which is pretty cool. That's a fact. Wow. Um, that's a fact. Yeah. And I think there's a, there's a great deal of confidence too Mm -hmm. in like, being able to do something as just concrete as like, screw it. I'm going to call myself program manager. I'm going to call myself a UX writer. Like there is a degree of belief in yourself and okay, fine. Maybe I don't know everything about it. I'll stretch into it. It's like that. Uh, I think they've now debunked this statistic, so I don't want to, you know, quote this too strongly, but how like men will apply for a job if they're 60% qualified and women won't until they're a hundred percent. It's kind of in that same vein of like, are you willing to believe in your own competence to stretch into things that maybe you're not a hundred percent comfortable with, but are more in line with your potential? Absolutely. I mean, what, what's the saying? You got to walk around having the confidence of a mediocre white man. Yep. I can't think of a better scenario than going into a job where you're just like, yeah, I mean, I can do most of this. Like, yeah. Knowing that you guys are going to teach me everything else. Like, I don't need to be an expert yes. in any of this stuff. It is 2022, sis. You can literally go on to TikTok and learn how to become a UX writer, learn how to become a product manager. Like, like we just got to stop putting these limiting beliefs on ourselves because it's literally impacting how much money we have. Like, it's yes. literally stopping us from getting from the big bags. Yeah. If I had listened to those naysayers back at Amex, I'd probably still be sitting in the same role twiddling my thumbs. <laughs> and now I'm a fully remote hottie and I'm just like not being micromanaged, making more money than I've ever made and also still being able to show up as a creator. Like this is it, sis. Like, Dude. And it didn't take me that long to do it. I didn't have to put right. in all of these years to prove myself. It's like my average that I've worked at a company is two years. Two years, mm-hmm. like two years is going to go by fast anyway, sis. It like does. you may as Gosh. well use it to say, well, yeah, in these last two years, I've grown my salary by $70,000. Like that's, those are the wins that I want you to have. Not, oh yes. yeah, I took on all of this work and now I'm in the same place and I'm not yeah. promoted. No, 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 no. That story mm-hmm. ends today. Or like I'm cobbling together 14 different side hustles that no. pay me $20 an hour. It's like, I think that's the the seven streams of income thing that gets tossed around where it's like, you're probably better off. Most of us honestly are better off devoting that energy to our actual jobs and, and doing exactly what you're describing. Um, man. Wow. Yeah. Talk about a crazy ROI. <laughs> I love Come it. Come on. Thank you so much for being here, Sunia. This was a blast. Thank you, Katie. This is awesome. I absolutely love what you're doing to, oh, thanks. you know, just make money more relatable, more fun. Um, and we need that. So thanks so much for having me. Rich Girl Roundup. Yeah. Love it. All right, everybody. To close us out this week, we've got another Rich Girl Roundup. As a reminder, we will take listener questions every month. I'll put out a call for questions on Instagram, so follow Money with Katie if you're not already. And we will pick one that feels interesting and widely applicable, and we'll answer it. As my standard disclaimer, I'm not a licensed financial professional. This is not financial advice. This is what would Katie do in your situation. This segment today is brought to you by Betterment, giving you the tools, inspiration, and support you need to become a better investor. Here's this week's question from Neil. Hi, Katie. I'm Neil, and I'm calling into Rich Girl and Guy Nation from Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania. 
I'm currently in between a year-long contract that pays a third better than a full-time position and a full-time position with better benefits. How do you decide? Is contract work versus full-time employment better? Thank you. This is a great question, and I think the answer will be a little subjective depending on how you like to work, Neil. I've done both contract engagements and full-time engagements, and I think most of us would generally agree that the full-time employment agreements are better from a few standpoints, like access to a 401k and employer matching that you likely don't receive as a contractor, health, dental, and vision insurance, and the sense of long-term security, though if you're an at-will employee, that may be a perception that's not entirely grounded in reality, but I like that you're highlighting that the contract role pays 33% more than the full-time role because I think people will find that's pretty common. This is because providing all of those full-time benefits costs money. For example, the Kaiser Family Foundation found the average cost to an employer to provide health insurance to an employee and their family was $16,000 in 2021. This is why I'm such a proponent of universal health care as a side note and believe it'll actually make our economy more competitive because employers won't have to bear the brunt of insuring citizens. That 16,000 bucks is considered part of your total comp as a full-time employee, which means it's money that you're not being paid as a salary. So if I were weighing these two options myself and all else was considered equal, and by that I mean I'm equally interested in both companies and both jobs, I'd probably try to understand what the true differential is between compensation by assessing the true value of those benefits. For example, how much are you paying for health insurance as a contractor? How does the coverage compare if you can find out with respect to your deductible and your out-of-pocket maximum as a full-time employee? Like if you're putting numbers around it, for example, maybe you paid $33,000 more by the contract role and your health insurance costs to provide for yourself are $10,000 per year. Well, you're still coming out net $23,000 ahead. Same with the 401k. If you don't have access to one as a contractor and you need to use IRAs instead, you can calculate the difference in tax savings. For example, if you're in the 24% bracket and you contribute the full 20,500 to a 401k, you'll save $4,920 on your taxes plus any matching contributions you would have received from your employer. But if you're a contractor, you'd have to use an IRA instead with a $6,000 limit, which only creates $1,440 in tax savings for a net difference of $3,480 and whatever the match would have amounted to. In this example, though, it's clear that you are still in the black as a contractor. If the pay difference is that drastic, but It'll depend, of course, on the actual numbers. The cost of your health insurance, the marginal tax bracket you're in, and whether or not you actually plan to leverage a full 401k uh, plus the employer match and any other monetary benefits you may have gotten from the full-time role. Being a contractor can have some benefits too, since you're hourly. They have to pay you overtime if they require you to work more, whereas a salary doesn't typically come with that perk. So thank you for the question, Neil, and I hope that helped. All right, y'all, that's all for this week. Before we go, comment below what you thought the most interesting part of our conversation was, and remember to like and subscribe to our channel. I will see you next week, same time, same place on The Money with Katie Show. Our show is a production of Morning Brew and is produced by Nick Torres and me. Sarah Singer is our VP of Multimedia and additional content editing comes from our lovely senior editor, Hannah Velez. Our video producer is the fabulous Christy Muldoon and Sam Cat is our vice president of chaos, while Jojo Beans is our chief of woof, barking at the FedEx man every time he comes to the door during our recordings.